webinar series where we initiate a conversation with the industry to get some real time perspective over the change in design and design practices uh, we've had three series already so i would just like to highlight a few statements that surfaced during a conversation with the other industry experts the first one was form augments function instead of following it the second is something that's very interesting that came about was sustainability lies in the process than the actual product and yesterday we got to know that no education was biased towards design and design is not biased to any education uh, we have another very very interesting topic today and that's something that i personally am very fond of if you've ever spoken to me at the jury i think you would have heard this word come out of me multiple times which is biomimicry to break it down to students who are maybe unaware or who are new students who have yet to take who was supposed to take classes with us still uh, i'll tell you something in a very easy way for you to at least get an understanding of what this topic is we need to consider how nature has already fixed many problems the society is facing we have to consider that animals plants and microorganisms are experienced engineers and now we need to put their experiences in our experiences and learn from them this approach has helped many designers create innovations that are not only sustainable but they're also profitable and it's very important as a designer to understand this approach and use it in your design processes i'm very very happy to have mr prashant dhawan who is the co-founder of biomimicry lab india and studio and biomimicry india network you know he prefers to call himself as an amateur researcher of issues related to sustainable happiness i think that's a beautiful way to put it uh, mr prashant dhawan has also conducted biomimicry workshops and talks for various corporations and institutions including isro cii mahindra and mahindra axis bank iit gandhinagar nid tedx talk to name a few so i'd love to have mr prashant um, i'm very happy and I'm, i we welcome you from the behalf of the institution and the students uh, that you're here with us and uh, you would be talking about biomimicry to our students and how this technique or this process could be used by more and more students to have a more sustainable outlook uh, in the present scenario yeah uh, so thank you akshara should i um... then uh, switch on my video and uh, share the screen yes please so what uh, do you say yeah so first of all namaste to everybody because i think shake hands for some time is uh, is out and uh, what i'll do is i'll share my screen now and uh, and then we'll start so let me just check uh is my screen uh, visible now can everybody see yes it's visible okay so uh, so i think it's a new experience for all of us i have was used to being in nature and now i'm in front of my laptop and i'm in front of my laptop every day and today i'm talking to my laptop <laughs> so let's begin so namaste and it's second june a unique and unprecedented state of our world so i have a temptation that let me just give a webinar which is business as usual or should we take a pause and ask ourselves is there something is this an opportunity where we should question ourselves so let's not lose this opportunity so i have structured this webinar while i am we'll talk about biomimicry we are also going to talk about what this unprecedented pandemic is trying to tell us so you know this virus while has made life tough for us but i think it has also served a purpose it has made visible many fundamental truths which we seem to have forgotten so let's just see what was happening or maybe it's still happening in the pre virus days now let's keep our hand on our heart and look at this little graphic you know i think we had all started treating our environment as raw material most of us were either being told or we were looking at our environment and saying how do i shape my environment so that it can fit the economy increasingly people were found saying that how do i shape my people so that they fit the economy 
So we had somehow started treating and viewing nature as well as human beings as raw material who had to be shaped to fit in and nourish the economy. Now it took one minuscule virus. And what happened? We realized economy chodo. It is basically life. So really what this, this virus has done, and I think that's the fundamental truth it has brought about, that it's really about life. An economy and society is only worth if it enhances life. If those structures are not going to enhance life, then there is a problem in design. So we don't necessarily have such a big problem in terms of uh, that the economy is just evaporated. How can evap economy evaporate? It's because our designs are not holding up to ecology. So I think it's a good time to remind ourselves that we have to design our economy so that the economy is a servant to society. And the society should be designed so that it is alignment with ecology. Why is this important? And why is this important today? Because if we don't learn this fundamental lesson, then we are again going to go back to status quo and wait for another pandemic to happen or something else to happen. Because we have to get our frameworks right. We have to remember the purpose of everything. The economy is a tool. We created it. For what? To serve us. And if your servant becomes your master, then there is a problem. I think this coronavirus has reminded us that please treat your servant as your servant. The economy should be designed to serve society and society should be designed so that it's aligned to ecology. This, whether you're a designer, whether you're an architect, whether you're a politician, whether you're a bank robber, this rule applies to anybody who's going to be an inhabitant of our planet. So I think let's begin by acknowledging what this COVID pause had made visible, that it's all about life. When it comes to life, everything can be stopped. The economy, the society. So why not reimagine our structures? Now you will say, it's easy to say, how do we do that? There are a couple of other things that we have seen. What have we seen? I would say that what we have seen is that we don't have a problem of resources. We have a problem of design. What do I mean by that? Do you realize that while there are people who are facing problems of hunger, we have go-downs where food is rotting? 90% of our vehicles are lying parked and idle. While so many people are walking back home, no other species has this problem of resource allocation. This is a design problem. I want you to think with an open mind. Right now, all our thinking is conditioned by what we were taught. But when we start looking at natural systems, and I want to provoke you that as you start looking at natural systems, you'll see that we actually live on an abundant planet. We don't have a problem of resources. We have a problem of imagination. So where do we look? Where do we find this imagination? Let's look just outside our window, okay? Or maybe even inside. In India, we say that whether you look outside or inside, nature is everywhere. We are nature. But to make it simple, let's look outside. So let's look outside. If you see the human side, now that the lockdown is over, the first thing that I saw when the lockdown was over, that there were people fighting next to my house. Two cars had had an accident. Now, how many of you can almost say okay, within 15 kilometers of your house, there is some human being fighting with another human being over an accident. I think this is a very common sight, right? And we have all the technology. We have red lights, rules, police. And let's look at this other graphic. These are locusts. You know, we had this tiddas. These locusts have come all over. And you have these uh, birds and you have fish. Often hundreds and thousands of them. Have you ever seen them have an accident that you were hearing that, okay, 15 birds died today due to colliding? I think we should be paying attention because the rules of physics, chemistry, and maths are not different in these two technologies. What has happened is that the same education which freed us and gave us the ability to, to find new 
answers might have become our prison. It has become so strong that we have stopped looking outside. So why aren't traffic planners looking at birds, at locusts and saying, okay, why aren't they colliding into each other? What are the rules that they are following? Now, these are technologies which are now being studied in biology law and, and used by, by designers. They, these are called swarm technologies. Uh, let's look at this other thing. I just want to, want to bring certain things which are very close to us. You know? Like this is a road repair problem. And we all know what happens in India. Your road breaks down. Then uh, you wait for something to happen. It doesn't happen. Then somebody complains. Then people have to go out. Then they say, by file pending app. Often it takes months. Now, how many of you, I think all of us have seen a termite mound. Now, termite mound is a very similar to a city. You know, lakhs of uh, hundreds and thousands of termites are living. And that also is like a city and it also has a damage. But if you see that there is a damage to the termite mound, you will find within one day or two days that damage is repaired. It is repaired. It might not be the same shape, but it's repaired. Problem is the same. They can also say, hey, is it my way? Who is supposed to repair it? Do I need a sanction? Do I need to get an approval? Where do I get my team? Same problems that we face. At least we should have the curiosity. How do the termites do it? Can we learn from termites? This is, again, a system now, which is now being studied to create uh, resilient systems. But often, the answer was just next to us. Only our education had made it that we didn't know how to look at it. Similarly, you know, we are designers. We are always thinking in terms of fragrance, flavor, color. Just look around in nature. We are not the first ones to make fragrance, flavor, or color. In fact, if you look at nature, the amount of fragrance, flavor, and color that nature has is way, way, way more than what we have. Let's look at this other thing. We talk about clothing. Clothing is in some way insulation, also protection. Now let's look at these three animals. These birds, they are water birds. This is waterproof tubing, but it also flies. Imagine, can you create something? like this, that it comes out from water and can go directly into the air. That's the kind of hydrophobic uh, texture it has. The polar bear, one of the most cold region on the planet, what kind of insulation design does it have to take care of that heat? Camels in extreme heat. So all these things are inspirations just waiting for us to look at them and solve our problems. And why is it that we should be looking at them? Because none of them have been created in a way where it has harmed the planet. Why the way we do our manufacturing, some way or the other, we are harming the planet. So when we have this question, ke, okay, then what do we do? Then maybe we should be saying, let's look at nature and let's ask nature. Now, how do we ask nature? That's a smart question. And that's what we are going to answer in biomimicry. But first, let's look at the amazing possibilities in nature. Let's look at this other slide. I'm sure a lot of you are into fashion design. So let's look at the, the amount of fibers that nature has. These are just three things, you know, the spider web, the cotton wool, the fibers in tree bark. There are a plethora of fibers and all these fibers are not produced in factories. They're not produced by using high temperature or pressure. So these are fibers which do their job, do not harm the environment. and They have amazing properties. Similarly, I don't know how many of you know, a lot of literature is there in Indian design, which claims that the Lota is an amazing design, which is an Indian innovation. Now, I am a proud Indian. But my friends, I'm sorry to tell you that the Lota was designed by the humble water wasp millions of years ago. So that's the nest of a water wasp. So even a lota, not really uh, original. We have mimicked it. We should have the curiosity, how did nature arrive at the, the, that design? You, if you start now looking, you'll find there are many designs which are already there in nature. Similarly, let's look at this graphic. These are the kind of designs on the uh, right side of your screen that we do. Because every time we need a new color, we need to chuck something, discard it, get a new thing. But in nature, if you know how octopuses work and how geckos, uh, they are able to instantaneously change their color, not only change their color, 
but change the texture of their body. Amazing. Now, the rules of physics, chemistry, and maths are the same. The only thing is that the designer is not talking to the biologist and the biologist is not talking to the engineer. If we talk together, then we can figure out how to do it and we can start incorporating it and eliminate so much of the wastage. Similarly, let's look at this. On the right side is human packaging and on the right side is a pine cone. Now, how many of you know that a pine cone is a kind of packaging for seeds? And, uh, and this pine cone, even if, you, if it is a cut pine cone and you keep it in dry uh, area, it will automatically open up. And if you make the atmosphere moist, it will close up. I'm sure all of us have held a pine cone. How many of you knew it? Hardly any. Now imagine what a sophisticated design. There's no electrical wire. There's no other stimulus. It has the ability to self-close and self-open to protect its seed. Now imagine, could our packaging do that? If I was to give any of you the design brief, that design a packaging which is biodegradable, which looks good, which is structurally protective, protecting from moisture, and can respond to changes in external stimuli. A big deal. So there is so much sophisticated packaging in nature. Similarly, often we think nature array, you know, nature is soft materials. We are designers, we need hard and strong materials. Now, on our right side is something called the limpet. If you go to the ocean side, you'll find that there are these small uh, seashell kind of creatures and they are very, very hard. They are extremely hard and they are, you know, anything that produces which is hard uh, is produced using a lot of heat, a lot of chemicals, a lot of wastage. But these zero wastage made at sea temperature. So clearly the technology is there. Uh, and this is a very hard surface, one of the hardest material on earth. And you know, the spider web is almost five times as strong as steel in terms of weight. And what does the spider do? It just eats a couple of mosquitoes and there you have the spider. So clearly technologies are there. And let's look at this. You know, we all work in a team. Bees also work in a team. How can they make such a beautiful and sophisticated design like a beehive nest? Perfect excellence. So what I am trying to say is that the first thing we need to do is begin with a deep humility. And this is just a few examples. Now, hopefully, if you are beginning to feel that maybe we are not looking at nature closely, then that's the right beginning of biomimicry. A true beginning is to reawaken your respect and the way you look at nature. So nature has already uh, you solved most of the problems we grapple with today. And the great thing is that it's your biggest creative commons. There is no IPR. Tomorrow you want to copy anything from anything, you say, by, you know, it is patent protected. Nature has no IPR. So what an opportunity for India. Anything you copy from nature, Believe me, I promise you, you will not get a notice from the locust or from the fish. You can just take it. But the fact is, somebody has to then start this process. So this is a big opportunity for us. And I call biomimicry also very close to our spiritual process. I would say, in Hindi, we call it Samast Jeevan Ke Siddhanto Ka Anukaran. Now, all good. I think you're already thinking. So how do we do it? So let's go ahead. First, I think let's address this question that how can we be sure that whatever is there is in nature is truly sustainable? Maybe there is a better thing. So let's take a small journey back in evolutionary history. So the earth is around 4.5 billion years old. It's a big number. And out of those 4.5 billion years, life has been around for 3.8 billion years. For our convenience, we have said, let us assume that 4.5 billion years is equal to one calendar year. So each month is around 370 million years and each day is around 12.2 million years. So the earth was born 4.5 million years ago and the human species only came on earth 200,000 years ago. So that means we are only 24 minutes old. We don't have much experience on this planet. You know, in our Indian culture, we say that who are your elders? So our elders have all are all these species who have been on this planet for billions of years. And who are these species? So let's take a very, very, very quick journey that in this time of evolution, whether it is bacteria or birds or mushrooms, they have all come way before the human species came. 
and 99.9 percent of the species who came to earth before us are extinct which means that only those species which have survived which fit best on this planet have survived so which gives us a certain clue that there is less risk of copying their technologies so our species have come on earth only in the last 200000 years only you know 24 minutes if you take 1.5 billion years is one uh, one year and of these only in the last 10000 years did we settle down we became agriculturist even then we were living very close to the land learning from nature and only in the last 200 to 250 years we had the industrial revolution and that's when things changed they've changed so much that all our imagination the way we look at nature has changed so how smart is it then when you are looking for solution you say that i will only concentrate on the knowledge of last 200 years and 3.8 billion years whatever happened uh, is not important that i think is no longer going to get us anywhere because those organisms have also lived in the same operating earth uh, conditions on the same earth as we are and the most important thing is that for those 3.8 billion years these organisms have ensured that conditions which are conducive to life are not disturbed while in the last 200 years the actions of our species has created certain problems which are not conducive for uh, all life on earth and usually the result of this is the species goes extinct and we are beginning to feel that if we don't change our ways if a virus can do that imagine what a bigger thing can do so it is no longer i think an option i think it's an imperative that we change our ways the question is whom do we ask so let's ask nature now the interesting thing is nature actually tells us in biomimicry we say that nature has a single line design brief very simple and it's a design brief for everybody whether you are a politician or you are an engineer or you are a designer or you are a poet simply saying that create conditions conducive for life life with a capital l that means all life not just human life and if whatever you are doing aligns to that then you can go ahead otherwise you go extinct so this is the fundamental ethic and purpose of biomimicry often these things are forgotten because most of biomimicry unfortunately is taught by examples of velcro bullet train i will also be talking about the bullet train but the fundamental ethical anchor which i feel today we should agree on that we will henceforth not do anything which harms the health of the planet and that's the fundamental ethic of biomimicry because what has happened in the last 200 years we are facing climate change we are facing biodiversity depletion we are facing environmental pollution but we are also fa- facing a problem of waste now how many of you have ever seen waste in a forest there is no waste in nature waste is a human invention and i would challenge you that even unemployment is a waste have you ever seen a unemployed plant or animal think about it don't just accept anything that is fed to us it's a design error that's way we've designed our economic system there is a emergent integrator that there is unemployment otherwise no plant or animal is unemployed similarly if you find chronic addiction or dependence it's a design error you don't find these things why am i talking about things because i would want everybody to first understand that biomimicry is not just about again pushing the same economy what it is saying giving purpose and direction to the economy and these are the reasons that this economy and our social structures need to align with the planet these are the indicators so while having said all these scary things it is also true that we are at the cusp of unprecedented capabilities our earlier generations never had the capabilities we have we have quantum computing artificial intelligence nanotechnology additive manufacturing but at the time we have all these problems now uh, you must be hearing and i sometimes go to conferences and people are talking about are kya hoga what will happen we will lose our job which again is is the technology your servant or you are technology servant i think we have to become again very very clear we have been given a wake up call it is not that what the technology will do to us wrong what do we want 
the technology to do for us. We have to take control and give direction to our technology. So let's use this opportunity to say, now how do we use this technology to enhance life? Not be scared and say, what will this technology do? For us? Again, a small point, but a fundamental point. Because these are the things, if you agree on this and insist on it, then you say, how do we go about it? And how we go about it, that's where biomimicry is going to come in. So, although it's a tough moment, let's make a promise. Let's make a promise to create a beautiful, bountiful, and blissful future. Let's create a vibrant economy in a vibrant ecosystem. Instead of verses, let's make an ad. And then you can say how. And let's look at nature. I think nature will help us. Gandhi some said that speed is irrelevant if you're going in the wrong direction. So sometimes when you know that although we are going fast, the direction might not be right, then it's okay to say that, okay, can we correct our direction? And uh, am I just talking into the air? Not necessarily. You know, one of the biggest forces in the world right now is business, economy. And even in the economic sphere, at least in the academic circles, people have started questioning out the direction. So I can share with you that earlier business was saying that you do what you do, but give back in some way to the society, philanthropy. Then they started saying, nah, nah, you know, you have to mandatorily give back and they started corporate social responsibility. We have that in India. But increasingly in the academic world, uh, in the West, they have started saying that the core purpose of business should be aligned to the health of the planet. Now, this is new. And this is exactly what the kind of future we should be creating. So while I'm talking of these things, I want to share with you the beginning of this thinking is also, also happening. And so what should we be doing? I would say that we have to now become large-hearted and we have to enlarge our embrace to not be just human centered, not be just economy centered, not be just technology centered, but be life centered, life with a capital L. That means all life. And what is nature's design be? Create conditions conducive to life. And now we ask how? So that's when we say that, what would nature do here? How would nature do it? And how should we act like nature? So biomimicry, what it does is it takes the patterns and phenomena in nature on a functional level. That how does nature solve the same functions that we have to solve? And it extracts those functions and then guides us that if you do it this way, then you are aligned to nature. It is in no way saying that don't use technology. In fact, it is saying improve your technology so that they fit in better in this world. So as uh, the institute where I studied, they design, they define it. It is the conscious emulation of nature's genius. So what does that mean when it comes to application? So when it comes to application and when we have to engage with the industrial economy, uh, you can emulate nature at three levels. One is form. Form, as you most of you are aware, form is uh, something which is physical, measurable. Uh, one of the Easiest example is the bullet train, which is coming now to Ahmedabad and Mumbai. Now, have you wondered that the bullet train actually doesn't look like a bullet? Uh, the reason is that the bullet train in 1950s or whenever Japan designed it actually looked like the bullet, bullet because the human mind was thinking that this is the most aerodynamic shape. But they were having a problem. Whenever the bullet train would go in a tunnel, there was a large boom. So the government asked the engineer that, can you improve? and bring down this noise. So the engineer really didn't know because the human mind was saying that, it's, you know, what would be more efficient than a bullet shape? Now, fortunately, he happened to observe a kingfisher bird dive into the water. Now he realized that there is hardly any ripple when the kingfisher bird dives. And then he emulated the shape of the kingfisher's beak. And they did some tests and they found that this is actually much more efficient. So now, the train actually looks like a kingfisher's beak and it's called the Shinkansen. So that is where we have mimicked form to solve the same function. The function was the same. Kingfisher was diving from a, a fluid of low density to a fluid of high density. The train is going from 
uh, into a tunnel where air is at a higher density, same basic. So this is called <coughs> biomimicry at a, a form level. But interestingly, very few people know that there were two other birds involved. You know, while when they solved this problem, they found that there is a pantograph on top of the train. You know, it's the piece of the train which touches the wires above. And at 300 kilometers an hour, there is a lot of vibration. So how do you bring down the vibrational noise? So they looked at the owl, which is one of the most silent flyers. You know, it flies very silently. And there's a Adele penguin that goes, cruises through water without any river. So these two were the inspiration of the redesign of the pantograph. And none of these three as yet have sent them an IPR notice to Japan. And why we are paying for this technology. So guys, you know, if we directly go to these guys, we don't have to pay any IPR. So this is, uh, you know, mimicking form. But let's look at how the beak is manufactured. Now the beak is manufactured within the body of uh, the, the kingfisher bird. There is no, uh, it is not importing raw materials and it is not doing heat, beat, treat and wasting stuff and there's no chimney on the head. Now that is process. Now if we say we want to manufacture the train in a process where there is no heat, beat, treat, only that material is used which is required. That would be mimicking process. Now, am I talking too much into the air? Now, look at the opportunities with 3D printing and 4D printing it is giving. Those are the ways. They are also in many ways, that's additive manufacturing. So that we would say, now we are mimicking process. But those two are not enough. If you see where the kingfisher lives, the kingfisher is living in balance with its environment. So while it takes from the environment, it gives back in many ways. So overall, the environment is in a balance. Now, this is relationships, a systemic balance. So when we say that, okay, we'll manufacture, we'll take the form, we'll follow the process, but we'll also see the systemic fit. Then you say this is a system biomimicry. And that's true biomimicry when you do all three, form, process, system. Unfortunately, most of biomimicry right now is understood as just a crude mimicry of form or a crude mimicry, no. If you do all three, you'll find what I challenge you first. We don't have a problem of resources. We have a problem of imagination. If we start resolving our designs as per nature, you'll find that a lot of wastages will simply go and we'll have a more efficient and more abundant world. But most important, there are three key elements to biomimicry. And this is very important because a lot of people are saying our education is broken. It is broken. But biomimicry has taken that, uh, that challenge and it has said that true education actually and true practice involve three equal aspects which are inseparable. So while most of our education, engineering or design is about emulation, emulation is when you copy something and create something and design something. In biomimicry, we say that there are three things. The first and most important is ethos. What is ethos? Ethos is the simple thing, create conditions conducive to life. No matter how great a technology, how great an economic policy or how great a fashion design you have done, if it doesn't create conditions conducive to life, it is not biomimicry. We don't agree that it is the right design. So this is a big difference that we insist that you should do all three. Second is reconnect. Now reconnect is something which we have all forgotten. You know, we all say that um, education should have an emotional content. So we have to revive our love of nature. I think we, we all face a kind of embarrassment to use the word in love when we go to our engineering and classes. But we have to bring it back. Because without true emotional love, without actually going to nature and being emotional, you will not find the true passion. You will not find the emergent intuition. So in biomimicry, we said that ethics, emotional connect to nature, and then you do the intellectual part, which is, you know, coming up with the ideas. So this is a big difference and a differentiator of biomimicry, often not talked about. But if we miss these two out, we will again go back to another race. First, we were in a race to extract resources from. Now we will be in a race to extract ideas from nature. No. 
it will be a huge folly we have to make sure we are emotionally connected we have the ethic and then we can go and take the ideas from nature only then we will get balance so let's after all this you must be thinking that okay all this is fine is this working is this applied do you have any evidence so let's look at some case studies now we ourselves have done more than 126 workshops so i want to tell you this because you will be feeling that ye sab to you know this might be all air talk so this is not just air talk uh, and as you'll see we are probably the only subject which has been taught across disciplines right from Uh, you know business schools to engineering schools to design schools to biology schools to corporates to school children to cii to banks it's been i don't think any other subject has had that success and why is that happening because nature is about phenomena and patterns and once you start thinking in terms of and that's what the big challenge is that how do you do integrated thinking so coming specifically now to a few case studies that what happens when biology means design engineering business let's look at something that will make it more tangible so these are some examples from outside of india so we all know you know the lotus flower the lotus flower is a sacred flower in india and uh, why is it famous because it grows in a very dirty space but the leaf never gets dirty it is uh, you know it always is clean why generally people say it must be very oily actually not at a nano scale it is a very very textured leaf so what happens is that a thin layer of air gets trapped and the surface area of the protrusions is so less that dirt cannot find a grip that was nature's technology so once uh, industry understood this technology now they are creating you know self cleaning paints self cleaning fab fabrics and no chemicals are involved similarly there is a shark called the galapagos shark now this shark is a large slow moving shark but it never gets any infection or any biofilms on its skin now this is a big problem in the shipping industry that you know ships which are in water they will get infected with biofilms a lot of barnacles will grow on them so they were wondering how how does the shark and you know my guess is that after corona this disinfection thing is going to be begin globally so they said how does the shark do it and they find it's not a chemical it's simply the texture of its skin it has such a minuscule texture that if you just put that texture bacteria are unable to settle on it now by copying that mimicking that texture there are many companies which are creating surface coating and where are they being used toilet handles now that's a big issue work for us right that nobody wants to <laughs> look at or touch a toilet handle surgical places hospitals eat for us maybe even train so but inspired by by what by the galapagos shark similarly there is a new fabric and uh, from shoulder textiles it's called the sea change now you saw that uh, uh, how a pine cone can close and open on its own just based on temperature difference so they understood the technology and they have incorporated into a fabric material so the fabric itself will allow more air or less air depending on how much you are sweating and how hot you are and no other thing is required this is a smart fabric inspired by a pine cone similarly i think all of us you know are using velcro but do you know velcro is one of the first biomimetic inventions it was invented by a scientist who came back home with a dog and the dog was full of these burrs which are stuck on the fur when he looked at what, what was the mechanism that's how velcro was invented it's a biomimetic thing the original design came from nature recently uh, mercedes designed a car uh, it's a concept car called the bionic car and uh, the what's the problem in a car but the problem in a car is that it needs a large surface area in large volume but it needs to be aerodynamic so this car uh, actually was inspired by a box fish the fish is actually boxy which is counter intuitive that how can a boxy fish flow in turbulence but they found that it is so they emulated the shape and they created and they found that this shape is working in spite of having a large volume inside but they went ahead and they also wanted to reduce the weight of the car without weighting the uh, reducing the strength so they looked at uh, how bones and trees distribute material and they used a software which is produced by a company called altair um 
to create a new kind of structure now if you look at the structure earlier we would have said how will we build it but with 3d printing you can build this kind of structure so they've got a car which is not only lighter more fuel efficient but with much less material similarly you know if you look at any of the feathers or any of the animals outside have you ever realized their color never gets faded and whatever fabrics you guys and we make 10 washes and they are faded so scientists have understood how color is generated in nature by using that you can create without using any toxic chemicals you can create colors which will never fade now they are using this technology for creating uh, tablet screens also similarly i think we've all seen the lizards and geckos in our house they are able to just run around you know sticking and unsticking it's one hell of a difficult deal now they have understood this technology and they are creating gecko tapes now imagine the kind of toxic adhesives we use uh, they can be eliminated similarly a rhino's horn actually it can self repair it's a dead tissue which can self repair or using that technology a lot of self healing concrete has been created Uh, so there are many many examples i think i'm overshooting my time so i'll go through some of these fast and these of the projects which our own students have done so one student actually designed a filter uh, this was from amdavad university he looked at a mouse uh, 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 an animal called the uh, the kangaroo rat which never drinks water uh, because it never drinks water it gets all its uh, water from food its kidneys have to be very efficient so that all the water is recycled so they filter very well so inspired by that filtration mechanism they designed a filter uh, we did a workshop for mahindra and mahindra and they were having a problem of starting their tractors in minus 40 50 in ladakh and uh, we said that how come uh, a polar bear is able to wake up how come fish don't freeze so we realized that what are the strategies and that can help inspire better tractor design similarly this was a nid project where students looked at how a cat is unable uh, is always able to survive a fall and they understood the three strategies and they designed gunny bags you know which in disaster management we often throw gunny bags uh, that can be you know uh, that will always fall and not get damaged uh, similarly this was a project in sept university where um, they designed packaging which will actually tell you when food has gone waste like a banana tells you exactly when things are rotting Uh, so these are some other projects i'm going really fast because i think we are running short on time uh, but the important thing is uh, that biomimicry is a multidisciplinary field and i want to emphasize that that often people start with a lot of enthusiasm but our institutional structures are that that multidisciplinary conversations are unable to happen so let me be very honest that you need to develop a skill to do multidisciplinary work Uh, you need biologists engineers designers and more importantly to, to get a communication going you need system thinking skills and once you have that then believe it uh, and we have evidence to show uh, you can really unlock in innovation and the key thing is that we need to shift from human centered to life centered and a lot of companies today are are and you know using biomimicry these are just very few names which a slide i made 6 years ago there are many more companies and more important today when we are talking of atmanirbhar bharat you know you look at nature all of nature is inherently atmanirbhar you know nature has to meet all its need with what is available in place so if we really do biomimicry we will become truly atmanirbhar you know because that's the essence of uh, meeting all your needs with what you have and it gives us patent free technologies and most importantly we would be able to design in india not just make in india and you don't have to take my word so if you really read all the big people who've been around they've all been pointing us in this direction from aristotle to einstein to da vinci to newton really read them and you'll find everybody has been saying that look at nature and now we have a way but most important thing and in one word if i would say is there anything that we should do i would say just like you have a habit of brushing your teeth just inculcate a new habit of the mind that for most of our problems we should also ask what would nature do here even if you don't have the question the un- the answer we should have the right question and our journey will begin so thank you
there is of course a lot to biomimicry and there are deeper workshops to take you into the theory but today i just wanted to give you a sense of biomimicry and more importantly situate you the purpose of biomimicry so i think uh, aksara i'll probably end here and if there are any question i'll be happy to take it was also a wonderful presentation the fact that uh, you explained it so easily that this entire process seems so effortless and something that all of us could inculcate in our daily practices as well it's not that you have to be a designer creating something but i think it's also something that we as civilians or as humans could incorporate in our daily life and i'm definitely to be looking at birds a little longer now to understand why aren't they colliding and <laughs> that's something that you made me question another very interesting thing that you actually spoke about was how uh, waste was human created and how which means that all our design inventions have been flawed uh, because we generate so much of waste without understanding its uh, direct impact on our society environment and nature does not have any waste which is so true again you know when you told us about the forest i i think that was that, that was an eye opener uh, we do have a couple of questions and uh, so i'll just like get right into them uh, so i know that hello so hello i lost you for a moment so uh, the principles of biomimicry in the future design uh, it will be really interesting to know how did you choose biomimicry as a specialization for yourself uh okay my journey was that i was uh, till about 2009 i was uh, involved in design thinking mm -hmm. and uh, i actually went even to san francisco where you know the people who came up with the word design thinking i was very lucky to have met them and uh, be there but there was a dissonance you know uh, and in my close conversation with a lot of people actually even then in 2007 they were saying that the problem with design thinking is it begins with human centered by the time you do it becomes market centered and by the time it's released it's consumer centered so abhi because it is going let it go but there is a problem but we didn't have an answer to that so in 2009 i heard the word biomimicry and uh, and i met the gentleman and the gentleman is peter head you know he all he had all i understood is life centered and you know once you hear the word then i didn't need anybody then we got the answer that the error in design thinking is human centered life centered resolves it the question is kare kaise how do we do do that so that's when i had to go and take a structured course because while i understood but i needed the structure the methods the principles the tools to now make it life centered so that's where biomimicry really helps that once you are convinced that life centered karma hai then the real thing will be how that's why i had to go and specialize because i couldn't live with that question <laughs> i think we lost you there a little bit sorry we lost you a little bit over there i think there was a glitch in the uh, internet connection should i so i wanted to understand life centered design that's why i did biomimicry oh wow it's kind of funny even i i think a couple of years back i stumbled upon biomimicry i was quite young and i went to the bartlett show and there was an entire building structure that was mimicking how a spider weaves its web to increase urban density and i think since then i've been so drawn to this subject uh, but your presentation made me realize that i think i should take it more seriously for sure uh, for the next question uh, we have uh, the person says that sir we have understood from your presentation in the way uh, nature works a, and not just at a super uh, is my voice audible yeah akshara can you can you come again i got a gap i couldn't follow fully uh, so the person says that sir we have understood from your presentation biomimicry is dwelling deep into the way nature works and not just at the superficial level but as an interior designer and not having a biology background what is the best way to learn from the future from the uh, from nature yeah uh, i would say that uh, i would actually this is a great moment for interior designers you know i would look at the pandemic as an opportunity why because everybody is stuck at home mm -hmm. and what are they longing for for the outdoors 
<laughs> so the ability to create the experience of outdoors i think is going to be a big skill so in biomimicry we have a sub subject called biophilia biophilia is how do you recreate the sensory experience of nature and there is scientific basis to it which shows that if you create the sensory uh, experience of nature your hormonal levels start restoring your breathing your anxiety comes down and you know who's the biggest consumer of this design hospitals because that's where they need this so one of the things is that uh, understanding how do you recreate the sensor reality so sen so for example right now our air conditioning systems are static but in nature there is always a variability which we kind of also teach so biophilia is a big thing and there is something called life principles and deep principles uh, that comes to the uh, application part of biomimicry and a lot of it today is freely available on the internet otherwise uh, i think hopefully now biomimicry can be taught we ourselves are planning to launch courses uh, online courses in the coming days uh, but i think you know, eventually we have to develop a more a happier world I, i want to take this moment to say you know the industrial economy was based on two drivers that was fear and scarcity mm -hmm. if you want to create the ecological age we have to make it on abundance mm -hmm. and lack of fear now that's a challenge to imagination kar sakte ho entire nature to aise you know is built like that <laughs> so <coughs> i think while 90% of the time we do what is to be done give yourself 5% time to dream without fear of failure or ridicule don't worry you don't even have to tell those ideas to anyone look at nature it's possible <laughs> that is very true again you know uh, uh, there's there's also this thing called that you know the manufacturing industry told us and taught us and got us very very used to of assembling products instead of understanding how growth can happen organically and that's what we need to go back to that's that's so true uh, so our next question was that uh, what in your opinion are some of the challenges that students may encounter initially while working with nature science is there something that you also face while you were uh, starting to work with biomimicry that the students might also face yeah so the one of the biggest challenges that biomimicry is a is a team sport mm -hmm. it it requires the ability to put together a team where people can talk to each other and share uh, biological knowledge as well as uh, interesting knowledge uh, we actually it's a problem especially finding biologists but interestingly often we find biologists because of linkedin and facebook abroad who are able to communicate to us for example we had a student who was, who was a designer a painter but she wanted to design sustainable bottle packaging and she found there is a microorganism which can digest plastic mm -hmm. which is its food and you know so i said ke now i can't help you now you go to indian institute of science i know a scientist working on it you know jaise in 3 years so you put a tie and go to his lab find out because you know the problem doesn't pretend ke i have only come to a designer problem is complete it has to go through the navigation of science and all that that's the problem we have to create a ecosystem where it shouldn't matter whether you're a designer with a dream you know that's what happens in some of the foreign university you can just go catch a scientist say ke sir i have to understand that and they tell you and that's how innovation happens i have a feeling there is a, there is a big fatigue right now in innovation also in science i think they are pretending the real crux will happen when they begin talking to each other so i don't have an answer to it and i think if somebody in government is listening please help us out you know create multi disciplinary ecosystem so that is the big problem but if you solve that and take initiative uh, then i think you can do it and i would say that whenever you are confronted with such thing you know you look at free dates and look at amir khan and he says can who stopping you innovate go ask you know <laughs> So our next question. Uh, okay, there are a couple of them. I'm just going to select <laughs> the last one for today. Uh, so uh, another student is asking that in your talks you emphasize that we are nature, but we are a very young species. 
so how do you think we can find our way and in time because you know the current scenario humans have disrupted the the cycle of nature quite a lot so how can we all have a combined effort and uh, understand what to learn from nature quickly as possible uh so i think it's not very difficult i am actually a big optimist i always say that while we are a highly responsible species we are also the most trainable species have you realized that yes. at this age i am having to study and teach you and at the age of god knows 25 30 40 hum padhe ja rahe you know so we are the most trainable species the only thing is we have to get our training right the training has completely gone off track and especially after world war 2 so in a simple way i think we are at the cusp of an opportunity the mandatory education now should be learn how to be a responsible earthling after you know how to be a earthling then you can become an engineer architect designer bank robber stock broker everything allowed but right now what is happening you are all these things and sustainability is like a fashion accessory are ye bhi kar lo no 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 that should be non negotiable everything else should be negotiable so i think it is simply said i know it's difficult because all of us have kind of tied ourselves into this economy but we can also untie that's the beauty about being a trainable species so if you guys can start a movement and say ke okay चलो बैंक रॉब भी करोगे लेकिन खर्च कहाँ करोगे पोल्यूशन में मर गए तो यू नो सो लेट्स गेट द प्लेनेट राइट फर्स्ट एंड देन वी कैन डिसाइड व्हाट टू बिकम सो इट्स नॉट वेरी डिफिकल्ट वी गेट लॉस्ट इन जार्गन बट इट्स नॉट डिफिकल्ट वी कैन डू इट वी हैव टू जस्ट रियलाइज एंड कोविड इज टेलिंग अस के व्हेन इट कम्स टू लाइफ तो सब बंद यू नो सो सो लेट्स मेक द फंडामेंटल पर्पस ऑफ एजुकेशन हाउ टू लिव ऑन दिस प्लेनेट एंड देन यू डू वट एवर यू वॉन्ट Mm-hmm. Yeah. and i think that's something that the institution would be very happy to adopt as well a uh, biomimicry is such an interesting topic which hasn't been spoken a lot in india in my opinion and i would want to you know make sure that every designer who goes out of the institution at least has an understanding about it and has an understanding how to adopt it uh, but thank you so much for giving us your time uh, uh, i think the presentation was so insightful your views are so so good and it has definitely influenced uh, the students studying at the institution so on, the, on behalf of everyone i'd like to thank you for coming in and having the webinar with us so thank you akshara thank you to everybody for joining us and uh, namaste keep namaste. well <laughs> yeah and create conditions conducive to life <laughs> definitely <laughs> thank you okay bye So I know everyone has learned a lot. I did for sure. Uh, uh, you feel free to go down to your terrace and look at the birds. I know that uh, that's an interesting thing to know. Why aren't they bumping into each other? How are lizards so effortless at climbing different objects? I think when we start taking inspiration from nature, our designs become more and more uh, inducive into our environment, and we're definitely not creating a lot of waste material out of it, which is something that. we expect and hope all jadians to do uh, again if you have any questions please tell let your faculty know and we'll try and get you the best possible answers with your question and uh, we'd be having our last session tomorrow on green building and sustainability again it's open to both fashion and uh, interior give you more information on it uh take care stay safe